you know, ketamine therapy probably saved my life. Um, you know, it's still difficult kind of for me to even talk about a little bit. Um, I was in just a very desperate, bad place. And, um, you, you know, I was, I, I was just at the end of my rope. You know, I'd been working 60 hours or more a week in, in a job that was pretty thankless. And I was, I was uh, committed to it. I was really giving my best. And that was difficult to manage. Uh, I had a commute every day, of, like <laughs> through the city of Chicago both ways. You know, it, so, uh, you know, two hours, so that on top of it, away from home and, and the stress. And, uh, and then physically, I had undertaken a lot with jujitsu and these things. So I was just, I was really redlining. I was redlining every day. And emotionally, things were uh, kind of disintegrating and my PTSD was, uh, the pressure and the anxiety was growing. And I was not doing the things to help myself. I was just grinding and I was just pressing harder and harder just to get through it. I wasn't asking for help. I wasn't seeking a therapist. I'd stopped taking medicine, cold turkey. All terrible things to do. I don't recommend that. Um, and I, I was seeing a therapist semi-regularly. I, I had st started to uh, miss, miss sessions. And um, I had had a, a traumatic experience, a kind of a personal experience. And um, I think for the first time in my life, um, you know, I think, if I'm being honest, you know, there's like one thing I've ever felt I was probably pretty good at. And that's like being a daddy. And I felt like I was born to be it. And just no matter what, there was no insecurity there. And, um, you know, and I'd, I had uh, lost my temper and I had scared my daughter. And it was the first time in my life, you know, I had, and she's, she's 10, you know, and we all make mistakes, but it was the first time in my life I ever thought I compromised that one thing I was so sure of. And, that pushed me over my edge, you know, at that point. I just wasn't able to make rational decisions or, um, you know, so I, the therapist had brought up ketamine treatment and, and previously and mentioned how for a lot of soldiers or people suffering from PTSD that had been resistant to previous therapies that this was something new and potentially worth investigating. So, um, you know, again, it was, it was over the holidays. I was isolated, I was alone due to that outburst. I was by myself, literally Christmas Eve and Christmas, and I felt like my daughter hated me and no one in the world really needed me. They'd be better probably if I wasn't there. And, um, you know, so I made a plan. And uh, as a last dish effort scrolling on Instagram, I saw a suicide hotline. Just that easy. So I called the hotline and I talked on the phone for an hour and, and, and uh, they, the representative uh, didn't make me promise, but almost made me promise to after call my therapist. My next call is to hang up and pick up and call my therapist. And that's what I did. And she made a couple phone calls, uh, one of which was to a doctor at Innovative Ketamine, and they scheduled me, I think, within 24 hours. I was there. Um, and I was able to uh, get some really uh, dire treatment that I needed. The ketamine treatment altogether was really abstract to me. Okay, I was never anybody that really, uh, really did recreational drugs. I'm not a drinker. Um, so um, the concept of it altogether was just pretty out there, you know? And that's why I probably didn't take it super serious uh, as an option until I was very, very, very desperate. Um, it's really important to probably highlight the mental frame I was in when I walked in the door before I tell you the mental state I was in when I walked out. And when I went in, I was as desperate as everything I just previously described. I was convinced that if this little thing didn't work, I had a plan and, and it would be over very shortly. The pain would be over shortly. So that gave me a little bit of peace because my mind was made up. And I remember filling out the paperwork and the HIPAA forms, uh, waiting for the doctor to see me in the waiting room. And I was in such a distraught state. Uh, one of the questions was, do you feel suicidal? Or do you feel depressed? And it was a circle one through 10. And I walked up to the counter and berated this poor woman and said, how could you expect anybody to circle? This is a really complex thing and you just want to circle a number. I'm not going to do it. She goes, okay, <laughs> that's all right. Just have a seat and we'll have the doctor come see you in a minute. And immediately the whole environment shifts. There's this really angry guy who can't sit still and distressed. And 
at that point, it was gonna go one or two ways. I was gonna get help or security was gonna walk me out because it was that sharp probably. Um, fortunately, they took me back to a room. Um, the atmosphere is extremely clinical. They take a ton of time with you before and after. They give you a lot of history, perspective of the medicine, uh, current scientific and medical information. And, but more importantly, they took a lot of time to talk to me as a human and said, you know, John, essentially, why are you here? And, and uh, they knew it was very obvious I needed help because I was so upset. Um, and they helped me. So you asked me to describe my mental state leaving there. Um, and this is why I endorse innovative ketamine or ketamine treatment uh, so passionately is because I, I walked in there ready to leave, ready to give up. And um, immediately waking up from the therapy, I remember vividly feeling um, so differently that I kept asking my wife, do I look, do I look different? Like, do I look different? Because I felt, I felt so differently. And that didn't mean I just felt happy or not sad or a little better. No, I felt like my brain had rewired and I didn't know really how to process it. But things had changed and I felt a lot better. And it wasn't until uh, 15, 20 minutes later, I found even the words to speak other than do I look different? And I remember sitting in the car and saying, uh, okay, this is what it's like. I feel like I've been breathing through a straw my whole life for every breath. I feel like I've always had to go. And right now I can just go. And I've never felt like this before. And um, I still feel that way. I've never had to feel like that ever again. Um, so that, you know, that's my personal endorsement of that treatment. Um, I've had six therapies. I took a very aggressive course with it, something that they reserve for, again, combat veterans and people who have had a lot of severe trauma. Um, and, and it really did uh, help me. I, I wish I were a doctor and I could say something, uh, you know, more eloquent than it rewired my brain, but it did. Um, it definitely did. I feel like the ketamine treatment itself took away the option of suicide from me. Um, and, uh, the significance of that really is that I've always had that. And I've always questioned, was I born with that? Or is that something I learned? Because my biological father had committed suicide. And one of my sisters and myself were present for that. And I don't necessarily remember it anymore. I remember a fuzzy, fuzzy memory that almost feels like a TV show from childhood. There's no real, I barely remember it. Um, it wasn't always that way, you know? Um, so now I don't have a specific attachment to that, but I've always wondered, you know, when I was a child and preteen and I was sad or hurt or in trouble, that was always an option for me and I did self-harm and I have sisters that self-harm. So, you know, it's just something I, I was curious about. Um, I never thought that, um, I don't know, I, you know, it, I never thought it'd be something I'd feel safe enough to talk about. I never thought it'd be something I'd ever feel safe enough to express. I did feel really weak having those feelings. And when you're alone and you're isolated, and then it just makes you feel even more alone and isolated. So, you know, it's, it's even more important to me now to just talk and talk and talk until someone tells me to be quiet. Because there's other people that have reached out and, and told me that, hey, this made me want to share something. And uh, I really do believe that this could save lives. Um, it saved my own. And now that I'm in a totally different place in my life, it's crazy to sit back from my perspective now and think, man, I would have given up all these wonderful things or I would have hurt these people in my family and all these people I love and, and what that would have done to them. I can see that now. But I was so desperate and lost before that it didn't even compute. It, it just, it, it didn't even compute. And I think my self-esteem was so low that I actually believed they'd be better without me. And that's, that's a really sad place to be, you know? So I don't think people have to live like that, you know? Um, so I think it's important that we destigmatize these things and we talk and talk and talk and talk.